What's up guys, another episode of Site Visit this week. We are headed over to Cambridge. If you're gonna check on Project 170, we have our air barrier installed at the Sega Myrex product. We're gonna walk you through some of those details and then we're gonna head over to our Beacon Hill project, check on Project 174, where the window restoration company is on site and they're actually starting to do the install as we're wrapping up our interior trim. And then we'll see how we're doing on time. We'll go from there. All right, so we are in Project 170. And you can see that our air barrier is actually installed. So in a previous episode, we were insulating the walls. Uh, we have a mineral wool insulation, and now we have this air barrier on the wall. But if you guys remember, all of this is framed with light gauge metal. So we're not gonna be able to come through here and staple this, this air barrier onto the stud. So what we've actually used is the manufacturer has this double-sided tape. Uh, and that double-sided tape, you're, you're gonna unroll, and you're gonna put on your, your metal stud. And obviously this, they have this protective coating. The important part here, as I roll this back up, is that all of this stuff is pressure sensitive. So what that means is they're gonna come by and roll that onto the stud. And that's, gonna, that's really what activates the adhesive within this tape. From there, when they go to install this membrane, they're gonna pull off that protection, protective coating that's gonna open up the other side of the adhesive. And then they're gonna be able to stand this up and then roll this and then you get that permanent connection. Any of the seams, they have a special tape here. Same thing here, you can either roll it. And what Brian actually did is that he actually got some plastic scrapers and used the plastic scraper. And wh what that does is that it activates the adhesive and gives us this continuous air barrier. You look down below here, this is our vapor barrier that we had on top of our concrete slab. You can see our connection point from vapor barrier to this. Now, in a previous episode, I talked about radon. I'm gonna, I wanna retract that comment. What we're really trying to do is we're, we're really trying to do is control the air that's within this home and filter it accordingly. And what this is allowing us to do is keep all of the air in this space and prevent stuff from transferring from outdoor un uh, other units outside or even inside the wall cavity. We're, we're separating the air within this space and then we're exchanging it through our e RV system and, and filtering it accordingly. So that's really what this is designed to do is we've created this bathtub like um, membrane within the unit and we're able to control the air accordingly. Now, we have a couple detail, a couple other details. You can see anywhere that a, a cable comes out of the wall, you're actually putting a piece of tape on the bottom and then a piece of tape on the top and you're getting this almost like butterfly uh, look to it. Uh, you can see our outlets sticking within our common walls. You can see this is attached to the putty pad. So when they go to install our, our, our blue board, um, I, yeah, I'm sorry, our, our blue board, they'll be able to cut that and still get that airtight seal around with that, with that putty and maybe we'll come back with some acoustical um, sealant if necessary. Now, the other thing that we've, uh, where it's going. Oh, radiant. Um, so you get, you guys have heard me talk about in the other uh, episodes. This is our first layer. From here, we're doing a resilient channel on isolation clips. So we have cavity insulation, mineral wool. We have our air barrier, and we're going to actually start installing uh, isolation clips, which will separate, which will create a rubber isolation between our wall and our stud cavity. Uh, and then our resilient channel will give us a, a spot for that wall board to be installed. Two layers. That first layer of wall board is going to be a quiet rock. That first layer is going to be a uh, product called quiet rock, which is going to help combat sound even more. This is all about sound transferring between the homes. And then in between that, on top of that, we're gonna have a green acoustical glue, and then we're gonna have our blue board, and then our veneer coat plaster. So it's a multi-layer system to really help combat sound, which is great because even standing in here right now, uh, I think, were you the one that said it? It sounds like you're in a funeral home because it's so quiet. Mm -hmm. It's very quiet, and that's just with the mineral wool on the wall uh, and some of the putty pad um, details and, and air sealing details that we've already combated. So anything from here is going to really help uh, even furthermore, but also help prevent the echoing within the space. Um, the plumbers actually just left site uh, and they have our radiant manifolds installed. So what the, w the reason that we, we have these installed now 
is because we wanted to test the system. Uh, and in order to test the system, let me turn this light around here, is number one, we wanna make sure that we don't lose any pressure and that the system has no leaks in it. The system's been tested actually at 85 pounds, overnight didn't drop a half a pound which is great which is actually higher than it would ever run at anyway what we're going to do from here is depending on when the floor gets installed we're going to want to fill that system again whether we fill it with air or the actual water and the reason that we want to fill it when we're installing the floor is that as we're installing wood flooring if a nail or a staple happens to make its way into one of those pex tubings hopefully not um we immediately know about it. We're gonna hear hear the air rushing out. We're gonna see the the pressure drop, um, or you know, or see the water come out. Otherwise, if we don't do that and we run and install the entire floor, and then we go to charge the system, and that system doesn't hold water, it's going to be a nightmare to find out where exactly that is. So that's a you know, a, I I want to say it's a trade tip. I feel like everyone should know that but it's really important when you're doing uh, uh, flooring over radiant is to have that system charged either with water or air before you start installing the floor. Number one, like I said today, we tested it to make sure it, we don't have any leaks. And number two, again, uh, when you go to install that floor. Quiet day today, but we have all our guys coming back next week uh, to start working on this resilient channel because we are really tight on our schedule as far as getting our wall board installed. And speaking of schedule, I'm gonna actually sit down with Brian uh, and I wanna, he's gonna pull up the schedule on this project and we're gonna kind of walk through how we build the schedule from the beginning and then how we maintain it throughout the project and what that maintenance looks like as far as communication to the client, our subcontractors and us internally. So Brian, I was just saying how on this project, we are pressed on, with time to get our scope of the work with the resilient channel, the isolation clips, all of that done for our plaster. So our plaster has a date that he needs to be in here for an order for order for him to get out of here in time to go to his next job. I'd like to just kind of walk through the very beginning of the job. When we build this schedule, what you know, what steps are you taking to get that initial schedule put together? Uh, when we start the schedule, basically, it's it's. Um it's usually based off of, you know, either the scope or the budget. You know, you, you know, you, you usually do a really good job breaking out, you know, all the line items and and you know the values and and if there's if there's work that we're doing in house that has carpentry that has you know number of hours associated with it, we can start there at least. We can kind of um, we can imagine how the job will be built based on our experience or, or just, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take our best guess at it. And we'll basically take, you know, all the potential tasks and we'll break them out and just try to be as, I would say, in most cases, as detailed as possible mm -hmm. so that we can figure out where the critical path will be. Yeah, and that's, you know, and you talk about internally looking at how many man hours we're allocating to it, which is, which is great. It also gives us the opportunity to, if we start going over that, we can always reflect back to, all right, well, we budgeted three weeks. It took us four weeks. We can see that on the schedule next time. We know that this is a four-week project. But you're also doing the same thing with our, our vendors and our trades, right? You're, you're going back to them and getting feedback as to how much time do you need on site or, what, you know, for, for vendors, hey, when do I need to order that material to have it on site? Is that right? Absolutely. And I, I think uh, especially in today's times, um, you know, with the pandemic, we've we've discovered that the, you know, what we call lead times, the, the you know, when you order a product and how long it takes to show up at the door, uh, those lead times are um, they're sort of elastic now. It, it, it's, you know, you know, three months ago, something that was going to take three weeks to show up now you know could take three months you build out that initial schedule you know we're inviting our entire team to be part of that architect homeowner and then all of our vendors have access to it too while the, the screen can look really complex with all these micro tasks we can actually roll those up in two phase saying you know rough mechanicals is there any other benefit to kind of condensing it in, in that in that fashion depends on the type of client you're working with you know um, the client on this project is, you know, he just loves that detail. He just gets into it. He, you know, he's looking at all our daily log photos and he's just, he's making comments about, you know, how well, you know, we're, we're doing certain details. And, and I think um, with, there are some clients, I believe that, you know, it, it just, 
could be more of an executive mindset and they just want to you know tell me the bottom line where are we sure. you know okay we started working on finishes in the bathroom right. doesn't talk about you know that the plumber showed up to, to work on a certain kind of valve it's you know it's uh it's right. it's more it's a little bit more generic for them brian thank you uh we're gonna head over to beacon hill and check on the historic window restoration company all right guys beacon hill before we jump into the windows i wanted to address something you guys had commented on last week so this baseboard over here near the shower door you guys are absolutely right this is definitely a weak point where water could uh, actually make it way over that drain outside of that door. We don't expect it to be a lot, but there is that case that it could get there. So what we've actually chosen to do is that bottom, that baseboard, uh, we're gonna actually remove and we're gonna cut the cap off. So the cap will stay essentially in its place, but we're gonna replace the flat section underneath it with PVC. So once it's painted, you'll never know the difference. Um, and so if water does make its way out, it won't wick up into the bottom of that baseboard. Additionally, against that glass over here, go ahead, turn those lights on. Less than a 3 16 gap, but what we could do is they actually sell uh, what I call a bubble seal, which gets applied to the end of the glass, so it helps shrink that gap up. I don't think it will be necessary here, but it's something we can always add, at least for the bottom six inches. But that should really resolve that situation. Yes, it's not an ideal situation pitching the, the shower back to the linear drain, but we're working with existing conditions and had to make the best of the scenario. But let's go over into here, uh, into this bedroom. Big day because for weeks now, we've been locked in here with no natural light. And I'm a big fan of natural light as many uh, human beings I think are. Uh, and we've actually got our windows back. So these went out to a window restoration company. These are the original windows, original glass that were restored. And they've taken this back. They've cleaned up a lot of the old existing finish. Uh, they brushed on a new uh, finish. They're not looking to make this super uh, refined and brand new looking. They're just looking to clean it up and get some of the detailing back. All the hardware has been replaced with an antique brass, but where the, where the things that matter are here. So if I lift this up, under here is a double hung window. They've added a rubber bubble, bubble seal. Uh, you're not gonna be able to see that uh, just because it is on the outside but that way you're getting this, this connection to the upper sash. They've also added a rubber, bu rubber bubble seal here as, and up at the very top. Uh, furthermore, they've added this piece of bent metal, uh, which helps combat when, if air travels in, it's getting caught in here and it's pressing up against the side of the windows, preventing air from leaking all the way around. Uh, they've added a new mahogany guide uh, for, because it is exterior that which will get painted uh, and they've also restored these these poles here that have not been installed yet uh, but overall like i said it's really a restoration bringing this you know bringing it back to what it once was but adding some of the gasketing and um, air stopping details uh, to allow this window to perform better you, you can see it's still an old window kind of moves around in that cavity if i pull this down that upper sash moves as well you can see the other, one of the other things that they do is they replace the old ropes with this um, antique brass chain uh, and new window weights. And then making sure that the hardware up here is in good shape, it operates smoothly, uh, and then the existing window stops go back on. We'll clean those up and then we'll get painted with all our new trim. And these windows will perform a lot better. Uh, just a reminder, the glass cannot be replaced here. It's mandated by the uh, Beacon Hill Historic Commission or Landmark Commission. Uh, so all of the glass, unless it's broken, is original. Uh, and if it's broken, it's replaced with um, solid plate glass uh, to match what is adjacent to it. Uh, so beyond that, we are wrapping up interior trim today. In this place, all of the trim will get painted. Uh, it will be a sprayed finish. It will be consistent with our kitchen colors. And once all of the trim is, is painted, the ceilings are painted, then it will go into uh, wallpaper and primarily the entire space in here is getting wallpapered. Uh, so there's not a lot of wall paint. We'll make sure that the walls are primed accordingly. Um, but that's really our next step. I do wanna, I'm actually wanted to add something uh, that I watched Tim do the other day and it's this reference line here. So this reference line is actually snapped throughout the entire space. You can actually see it on every single wall. And if I come over here and see it here and then as well as right here. What that has done is it's given them an elevation to work off of for baseboard scribing. 
now here we're ba we're installing our baseboard on top of the existing floors so we wanted to make sure that the height of the baseboard over here the very top of the cap was the same all the way down there and you could do that with a laser but then you're resetting up the laser and creating a height tim tim and cooper have made this line snap this line all the way throughout high enough where you can reference it with with probably setting it as a at a laser first snapping those lines and then you can measure down and make sure your baseboard height is consistent really important in a couple of reasons number one we want that nice level baseboard so we're getting this this consistent parallel uh, space between baseboard and say crown molding or ceiling height but also our invisible doors here that we've talked about a handful of times is that baseboard goes right underneath that invisible door and, and that height needs to be dead on with the invisible door that Cooper's working on down there. So the baseboard is consistent and the door swings right above it. Um, so really great detail. You've seen, you've probably seen this reference line used for other things. This is the first time I'm seeing it used for baseboard. I think it's a great, uh, it's a great tip uh, to make sure the baseboard height is consistent uh, within a space like this. As you can see, it's a tight spaces stuff literally everywhere in here um and, and these guys are working in a manner to make sure that they get this stuff done but we're still and and most importantly we're ending up with the result that we're after uh and that is consistency and uh intentionality you know how, how much i love that word guys thanks for tuning in for another week of site visit uh as always make sure you guys subscribe turn on notifications follow us Stay tuned for tomorrow's uh, episode of Revealed. And before you guys ask, what am I wearing? I'm wearing the same Vans I wore last week. These are Liverpool modern straight faded black jeans. Work shirt. These are made by the guys over at Harnish uh, Workwear. And an Edgevale shirt jacket. See you guys next week. Ready? Guys, thank you for tuning in for another week of the... Thanks, guys, for... Ah, uh, that piece of baseboard. <laughs> yeah, now I have a blooper reel. <laughs> <laughs>